start the uh, presentation. So I am pleased to introduce Dr. Eric Martins today for the CGIBD microbiome seminar. Um, Eric received a PhD in microbiology degree in 2005 from the University of Wisconsin in Wisconsin and went on to the uni to Washington University Medical School uh, where he conducted research in bacterial genomics and systems biology. From there, he went to the Department of Microbiology and Immunology where he is now um, an associate professor. Um, all of his research interests uh, uh, are fascinating and he has published uh, extensively in all of them. And they include the recognition and metabolism of complex carbohydrates and other dietary nutrients by human distal gut bacteria, the role of bacterial degradation of secreted host mucus and extracellular matrix glycoprotein in inflammatory bowel disease, enteric infection, and colorectal cancer, um, genomic evolution and lateral gene transfer in human gut bacteria and their environmental re uh, relatives the assembly, ecology, and function of complex microbial communities in animal guts, the development of diet and microbiome-based therapeutics to treat human disease or promote intestinal health, and mechanisms of bacteria and bacteriophage interaction and persistence in the human gut. So um, thank you, Eric, for being here today. And uh, please. Thank you for the invitation. It was. Uh... I've had fantastic meetings with with uh, people this afternoon, and I, I I've long been aware of the, uh, the the quality of GI research at at UNC. And I had, hadn't appreciated it until I started looking around the the web page a few days ago that uh, NC State and Duke are also uh, part of the program, which just uh, blows my mind even more that the amazing uh, community of of researchers you have in the space down there. So uh, I'm gonna. And really uh, promptly on time today at, uh, at around 5:20 because I'm, I'm interested in getting questions and feedback, especially about the uh, some of the, uh, the the data that I'll show towards uh, towards the middle and end of my presentation. So I'm going to present almost entirely uh, unpublished data today, just because it uh, I think it's more fun and, and that way you get to see what's coming out. Uh, I'm going to end with a, a paper that's in bioarchives, and uh, I'll leave it there just in case I, I run out of time. And, and if you're interested, you can uh, you can track that down. The, the reference will be on there. And then um, most of the, the, the presentation will be on a uh, an IBD model that we're uh, just writing the story up on now and, and hope to get submitted uh, real soon. So uh, to begin with uh, the most important slide, uh, of course, uh, it's not to rush, it's the end. Uh, mostly the, uh, the, the data that I'm going to show today is driven, uh, project driven by a really excellent postdoc in the lab, Gabriel Vasconcelos Pereira. Uh, with a lot of help from a visiting graduate student, Mathis Walter from the Hesch Size Lab in Luxembourg. And the, the, together they've, they've uh, characterized and built this uh, IL-10 notobiotic IBD model that I'll spend a lot of time on. And then the last little story I'll, I'll touch on at the end is uh, work from another outstanding postdoc, post uh, Anna Luis, uh, basically characterizing uh, dozens and dozens of, of, of gut bacterial, in this case, mostly bacteroides enzymes involved in, in, in mucus degradation. Uh, and I, of course, I'd like to acknowledge our funding. These are uh, projects funded by uh, the NIH, uh, NIDDK now, but uh, especially the IL-10 project was uh, kickstarted by a, a really high risk uh, uh, award from the Kenneth Raynan Foundation. So I don't think we would have been able to, uh, to gather these data to support this model without, without their help. So uh, I'm very thankful to them. So I don't think this audience really needs a, uh, uh, a really detailed introduction to the importance of, uh, of, of microbes in the gut, uh, but just uh, I'll, I'll highlight some of the, uh, the perspectives that are specific to what we do, and I'll pepper in some of the, the, the more generic details along the way. But uh, we, of course, live in symbiosis with uh, many trillions of, of organisms, most of which uh, live, in our, live in our gut, most of which are bacteria, although we have uh, viruses and archaea and, and uh, eukaryotic or organisms as well. And these uh, one of the, the salient symbiotic uh, features that these organisms provide us with is the ability to digest complex carbohydrates, uh, particularly dietary fibers. And the reason for that is that our human digestion uh, is particularly well equipped to help us digest uh, proteins in our diet. Uh, these most proteins uh, absorb fat, uh, absorb uh, simple sugars, and break down things like soluble starch and absorb the glucose that, uh, that, it, that, that, that composes it. 
Uh, if you think in context of a food label, and these are basically most of the things that are on our food label, though we don't list our starch on our, on our food label. Uh, the one remaining category that, uh, that we see on our, on our food label and that uh, I'll argue today we wanna to maximize is, uh, is dietary fiber polysaccharides or just dietary fiber the way it's presented to us. Uh, we completely lack the, the enzymes and systems for breaking down dietary fiber. That's essentially part of the definition. And as a result, the fiber that we eat feeds the gut microbiota, which in turn uh, have evolved enzyme systems for breaking down those fiber polysaccharides. I'll touch on some of the diversity in, 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 those, in those complex carbohydrates. Uh, ferment those two molecules, metabolites like short chain fatty acids that we can absorb to get uh, extra nutrition through our microbiota from uh, the fiber that we eat. Uh, there's been some estimates that this could be as many as 10% uh, of our daily uh, calories in humans. I apologize for my, for my pointer jumping around. I have to keep bringing it back onto the screen. And uh, I, I still think one of the really uh, great ways to visualize this, this is now getting to be almost 20 year old data from Jeff Gordon and Frederick Backhead is uh, what happens when you remove the microbiota from, uh, my, from animals, in this case, these are uh, mice, that, uh, that are consuming a high fiber diet. So uh, these mice weren't, didn't have their microbiota removed. They were just, uh, raised as germ-free. And these are 12 week old germ-free mice uh, that never had a microbiota for the entire 12 weeks of their, of their life. And in this particular experiment, this conventionalized category over here, uh, CONV-D, the abbreviation uh, stands for conventionalized. These were mice that were kept germ-free for the first 10 weeks of their life. Uh, so for most of it, and then had a microbiota transplanted in uh, just for the last two weeks, weeks 11 and 12. And what Frederick monitored was both the body fat, which is about 50% higher in these mice that had a microbiota, and the amount of food that was eaten, which was lower in the conventionalized mice, uh, indicating that uh, when you have gut microbes, you can extract more energy and uh, store more fat from your diet uh, more efficiently, uh, eating less food. So I still think that's just a nice way of visualizing this, this symbiosis. Uh, we each have several hundred species that compose our microbiota or our microbiome. I'll use these terms uh, essentially uh, interchangeably today. And we've known for a long time now, this has become uh, clearer in the last 20 years, but it's been known for, for decades prior to that, that uh, of the dozens of, of extant uh, phyla that are present on, on planet Earth, bacterial phyla, really only a few have evolved to colonize the, uh, the, the gut of, of humans and other mammals. And these are organisms in the broad taxonomic groups, uh, the firmicutes, these are gram positives, uh, bacteroidetes, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, and the microbial. I'll talk about members of all these, but we've mostly historically uh, focused our studies on uh, members of the genus bacteroides, which are prominent, at least in, in industrialized humans, uh, members of the, bacteri the bacteroidetes. So the genomes of our, of our symbiotic gut bacteria are reflective of that ability to, uh, to help us digest our, our dietary fiber polysaccharides. So this is also a, a somewhat aging uh, illustration from Bernie Henrisat's lab. Uh, uh, Bernie and his lab run a, a database called KZ, uh, that stands for Carbohydrate uh, Active Enzyme Database in Marseille. And in this, this, uh, this image from, a, from a, a paper they published in 2013, they enumerated in about 175 different sequenced human gut species. So these are in some of those same phyla, the firmicutes, bacteroidetes, and so forth. The numbers of carbohydrate degrading enzymes. In fact, they only degraded, they only enumerated the two major ones, so glycoside hydrolases and polysaccharide lyases, in each of these genomes that had been sequenced in 2013. And they can make a, a much bigger version of this, of this uh, illustration of, of this figure now, and it would uh, reflect the same thing with just with just more sample size. And you can see that some of the organisms in the bacteroidetes have uh, scaled to this, this uh, scale uh, legend over here. Uh, hundreds of enzymes in their genomes, like B. ovatus and B. intestinalis, bacteroides data, the Omicron, which we'll talk about today. Uh, and even members of the firmicutes have, have uh, increased diameters of these, of these circles, indicating that they have uh, a lot of enzymatic potential encoded in their genomes. Uh, I added one small feature to this, uh, this figure from, uh, from Bernie's lab, uh, I added the number 17, which is, you probably can't see it that well on your screen, the small purple dot over here, which is scaled to the number of, of glycoside hydrolases that are thought to be encoded in the human genome and secreted into the GI tract. Virtually all of those 17 are, are, are amylases, starting with salivary amylases and then pancreatic amylases that help us digest that one complex carbohydrate, uh, soluble starch that, that we're well equipped to, to, to digest. Uh, the, and if you sum, sum the circles of the rest of these uh, these individual genomes, the number comes to around 10,000 
And so that's obviously orders of magnitude more than that 17. But uh, what we've come to appreciate over the years is that the catalytic specificities of these, of these individual enzymes, uh, the organismal level, at the, the functional uh, gene locus level, and then of course at the enzyme level, basically equip this consortium of, of, of microbes to digest all of the different complex carbohydrates that are in the fiber fraction of our diet. So said more succinctly, uh, we've relegated all of our fiber digestion, a whole uh, element from our food label to our gut bacteria. If you uh, then think about the gut in a geographical sense, and I'll uh, sort of keep this as a focus of, uh, of the theme going forward, uh, obviously the, the dietary uh, fiber sources, uh, which are mostly plant-based that we eat, are sources of different, uh, of different forms of fibers. These are just some broad categories. Within, each, within many of these, most of them, there's different uh, chemical uh, forms of fiber polysaccharides. But if you partake in a, uh, in a carnivorous diet, there's also different fiber polysaccharides that are in animal tissue, uh, glycosaminoglycans like chondroitin sulfate and heparin sulfate. There's just less than you get from a plant cell wall. Uh, but these are important for um, our gut microbes to degrade. We're, we've dabbled a little bit and we're still very interested in the microbes that compose the microbiome themselves. And these are really some of the master glycobiologists uh, in nature, especially gut bacteria. They make capsules and cell walls uh, a lot of different EPS and polysaccharide capsules for protecting themselves. Things that look different than in any of these other categories. And we don't really know much about what those, what those do or if, I, if other organisms in the gut uh, are benefiting from their production. But I think the answer is probably yes. But I wanted to end with this category over here, which is the carbohydrates that, that, that we make ourselves. And the carbohydrates that we produce ourselves in, in the gut are predominantly derived from mucus, which is a, uh, a fascinating biopolymer produced by goblet cells. Uh, constantly being synthesized and secreted, uh, in essence, to form a protective barrier between our host tissue, our epithelium, and, and immune system, and those hundred trillion organisms that are doing beneficial uh, microbial physiology for us out here. Uh, they're still bacteria, and they're still sources of uh, TLR ligands and, and, and other metabolites that could be harmful to host tissue if they get too close. So we, we keep them at, at some distance by producing mucus. Mucus is... Uh, up to 80% of its mass is, uh, is carbohydrates in the form of, of what we call O and glycans. And I'll introduce those uh, in, in just a few seconds. So this illustration on the bottom just uh, highlights some of the compositional diversity in different glycans. So if you take starch, which I have highlighted up there in red, if you uh, were to eat starch from uh, say a, a plant like corn, uh, and and, and uh, the, the source of that, uh, the, the structure of that molecule can be up to a million different sugar units which in this case, starch is just made of one uh, sugar co uh, component, glucose, which is tied together in just two different linkages, alpha-1,4 and, and alpha-1,6 linkages. But it's a, it's a very large molecule. So if an organism were to degrade this, it doesn't need very many enzymes. It just needs maybe ones for the, the, the four and the six link linkages and uh, ones that are specific for glucose. And it can handle that, that depolymerization with, with relative little enzymatic capacity. In contrast, uh, mucin and uh, the dominant mucin that's secreted in the colons of humans and, and other mammals, including mice, is a molecule called mucin-2 or muc-2 that when it comes out of those goblet cells is impressively large. The building block of, of the mucin layer is uh, up to 2.5 million Daltons in size. And it's composed of a, of a, of a uh, backbone polypeptide that from its uh, end to its C-terminus is over 5,000 amino acids long. 37% uh, of those uh, amino acids are, are, are three anine residues, and there's many other serine residues. And to those uh, two amino acids, which of course have hydroxyl side chains, get attached a number of extremely complex, uh, in terms of their glycobiology, uh, glycans that are those that are those O-glycan chains. So these always start with a uh, an amino acid link GALNAC, but they uh, contain uh, some of a uh, number amount of these other uh, four sugars: uh, N-acetylglucosamine, galactose, fucose and sialic acid, sometimes with modifications like sulfate, which I'll, which I'll come back to at the end. So if a bacterium is degrading this, it has to degrade with the steric, uh, sterically hindered nature of this densely glycosylated glycoprotein, but also the glycan diversity that's in these chains. And one of these mucin uh, glycoprotein monomers can contain up to 100 different variants of this O-glycan structure that are just different combinations of these linkages. So uh, bacteria that have evolved to degrade this need uh, uh, an immensely more uh, elaborate repertoire of enzymes than for something like starch, which is relatively simple and repeating in its structure. 
when I uh, started my my postdoctoral work in in Jeff Gordon's lab, the uh, the genomic era was really just kind of getting uh, up and running, and uh, his lab had by themselves sequenced the the genome of Bacteroides theta iota, theta iota omicron. I'm going to call it B theta for short going forward, and published it in in 2003. And uh, what became immediately apparent from sequencing that genome is that its uh, its genome was was chock full of, of of systems for degrading complex carbohydrates and all these colored uh, systems uh, that are annotated around this this uh, genome schematic are uh, involved in, uh, in in carbohydrate degradation. We hypothesized it back then, and, and then we subsequently studied it. Uh, Bacteroides ovatus was an organism that uh, was one of the first organisms that came out in the uh, in the jumpstart phase of the Human Genome Project. And uh, when I started working in Jeff's lab, I, I took these two organisms and, and phenotyped them in vitro. And impressively, uh, just these two organisms could alone degrade nearly all of the common dietary and host glycans that we could either buy or purify. So B theta, for example, is a mucus degrader, and it degrades uh, mucin with these uh, labeled with these gene clusters that are labeled with O glycans. That's a, a phenotype that Biovatus lacks, but Biovatus is uniquely equipped with some of these hemicellulose utilization systems to go after xylan, which is in your corn and whole wheat and beta-glucan, which is in your oatmeal, and xyloglucan, which is in your fruits and vegetables. So uh, these annotations, by the way, were made largely through growing these two organisms separately on these individual substrates after we knew what they grew on, and then doing uh, uh, gene chip functional genomic studies to find out what genes were induced, and then uh, through a number of collaborations, uh, purifying individual enzymes, doing the genetics to build a really solid foundation of, of bacterial behavior in the gut. Uh, Quite amazingly and quite impressively, just these two species have 170 different unique uh, gene clusters that we call polysaccharide utilization loci or poles for short. Those are all the colored uh, systems around these two schematics. And you can see that most of them are unique to, to, these, two geno to these two genomes. So there's a lot of diversification. Uh, each one of them uh, encodes for a separate set of functions that target a different polysaccharide. And again, uh, impressively, uh, just these two organisms, two of hundreds that uh, many of us are, are carrying it in our, in our GI tract, add uh, 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 around 2,000 genes in that, and, and about 650 additional enzymes to our digestive repertoire. I'm not going to go into any of the mechanistic studies that we've done in, in, in the last uh, uh, 10 or, or 12 years, but uh, a former graduate student, Rob Blowaki, and I just had a, a, a mini review come out in uh, Journal of Bacteriology. I think the official print was last week. It was available for a while before that. So if you're interested in the details of how these systems work, that's all summarized uh, pretty succinctly in that, in that mini review. One of the, the reasons why we've uh, endeavored to go down this path of, of studying these, these organisms in, in deeper detail is to begin to build a picture of, of how they behave in more complex communities. And so one of the steps along the way, uh, this is also a paper that we're planning to submit next week and there'll be a preprint version of it uh, posted as well is to start to understand and characterize how individual uh, organisms of the dominant, uh, e even the rare organisms that we see in, in the microbiome behave. So this is data from a custom anaerobic growth array, uh, 354 different human and animal gut bacteroidetes isolates. These are just in that one phylum that was on the right of that uh, image a few slides ago with all the circles on it. And uh, we tested these species in a panel of, uh, a custom panel of carbohydrate uh, 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 carbohydrates uh, arrayed in uh, duplicate uh, non-adjacent wells in a, in a, in a microtiter plate, and we uh, watched the, the ability of bacteria to grow on these in an anaerobic plate reading robot. So essentially this heat map summarizes the results of 32,000 uh, plus individual bacterial growth curves, and each uh, uh, elongated rectangle, rectangle here is the results of two individual growth curves at, uh, averaged together. And so this array contains 30 polysaccharides and 15 monosaccharides. I'm just showing the polysaccharides here, but what it begins to reveal is what the, the metabolic uh, potential is of, of some of these organisms in the gut. So you can uh, see that. Uh, and the other thing is that on this vertical axis, what Karthik, uh, the, the master student who worked on this did was he uh, performed unsupervised hier hierarchical clustering on these utilization phenotypes to bring phenotypes back together that were more similar to each other. And in parallel, we sequenced the 16S genes of these organisms so we knew who they were. And quite interestingly, that clustering brings back organisms within the same species. So for example, we had 56 bacteria fragilis isolates at the time. All 56 of those fall onto this single branch of this cladogram that reflects their physiology towards carbohydrates. So these first four columns are starches, 
This next column is the common prebiotic inulin that, it, that all these strains use very well. And this last column over here is the ability to use, utilize mucin glycans from, uh, this is from mucin from, from, uh, from uh, porcine gastric mucosa, which a lot of these strains use quite well. Uh, this particular species and all the strains of it generally lack all of this metabolism uh, in between. But when we begin to go down and look at organisms like B theta, it retains a lot of that same physiology that Bacteroides fragilis had, but it picks up this whole block of glycosaminoglycan and pectin degradation. As we go even farther down towards Bacteroides ovatus, it retains a lot, uh, much of that, but loses some of it in here. And then it begins to pick up uh, a lot of this hemicellulose uh, uh, metabolism, which on, that, on that, the bottom part of that last slide was some of those gene clusters and functions that were colored in pink. So we're using this and we're, we're interested in expanding this towards uh, members of other uh, phyla, deeper cultivation of members of, of, of this group to begin to understand and build a collection of organisms uh, uh, for which we understand the function uh, in, in, in the phenotype uh, uh, quite, quite uh, uh, deeply. What's interesting is it comes out of this, uh, this analysis, and this is the last point here, is that there's a, uh, a pretty strong negative correlation between the ability to degrade mucin and the ability to degrade fiber. And you can really just see that nicely by the way this heat map organizes. All these mucin degraders up here generally have a, a more scarce ability to degrade these dietary fibers, which is basically everything from this column over towards mucin. Whereas as soon as this phenotype begins to wane in the B. ovatus, B. xylanosolvins lineage, some of these strains have this quite well, these ones up here, it begins to, 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 to uh, lessen and disappear is when we begin to see uh, different taxa pick up fiber degradation. So uh, we're not sure exactly why this is. Uh, it, it, there could be some exclusivity for this niche, or it could be that since mucin is always omnipresent in the gut, since the host produces it, there's less uh, selective advantage of the bacteria for, for utilizing these other traits because they can just become uh, specialists for mucin. And I'll uh, support that uh, on data from uh, in just one more slide from now. So getting into kind of the, the unpublished uh, part of my talk, uh, we're really uh, taken with this question of whether or not mucus utilization by gut bacteria is, is, is sometimes bad for the host. And uh, this slide kind of summarizes an overarching a uh, theme in the lab, and that's if, if we consume uh, a lot of the dietary fiber that's, uh, that's in uh, the grains, fruits, and vegetables that, that we should be eating uh, a lot of, and consuming the fiber polysaccharide molecules like these that, that are contained in them, then we occupy our mic microbiota with a lot of, uh, of physiology digesting these for us, and perhaps can, uh, can uh, reduce the amount of mucus degradation uh, that occurs. And those mu mucin glycans that are in uh, this, this mucin layer are chemically different, like I highlighted uh, early on from these fiber polysaccharides. So they require different genes and in some cases, uh, different organisms. So uh, this starts with a little bit of published data. This is from a postdoc, Mahesh Desai, uh, who, who published the study uh, four years ago now. And, and he came into the lab with this hypothesis that I, I really just summarized, so I won't uh, reading it, that basically uh, lacking diet, diets lacking dairy, dietary fiber will promote mucus degradation and potentially cause harm to the host. And so to begin to approach this in a tractable way, uh, Mahesh used a, a technology that I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, since you've got one of the best facilities there uh, in the country uh, is germ-free mice. So these are mice that are completely lacking microbes. Those ones that gained less weight on that, uh, that data panel from uh, Frederick Beckett and Jeff Gordon. And he implanted a phenotypically characterized synthetic microbiota. So we just started with 14 species. And these are five bacteroidetes, five firmicutes, uh, an actinobacteria, uh, two proteobacteria, E. coli, and this uh, sulfate-reducing D. piger shown over here, which is not uh, on this heat map, and a verruca microbium uh, called Dacromancia mucin filla. And so one of the advantages of starting with the synthetic microbiota is that, uh, and this is sort of a subset and also a slight extension of that heat map that I showed uh, two slides ago, is that we could pre-phenotype these organisms in uh, this array of carbohydrates. So our fibers basically start here and go this way, uh, and then starches are up here. Uh, as to whether or not they, these organisms could degrade these particular fibers or whether they could degrade mucin glycans, which are the, the endogenous uh, components of the mucus layer. And as you can tell from this heat map, only three of these species, B. theta, B. K. K. and Barnesiella, intestinal hominis, among the bacteroidetes can degrade mucin. And Acromancia mucinophila, which is uh, mucin lover, as its name implies, is very specialized for mucin. So this is one case where we see specialization, actually quite exceptional uh, specialization for mucin. Uh, this strain only uh, degrades mucin oligosaccharides 
and can only utilize three of the component, the five component sugars that are present uh, in, in, in mucin. So fucose and the two N acetylhexosamines. So it ignores glucose and, and all these other carbohydrates that are that are floating by in the gut. But we also see that we have fiber degraders like Bacteroides obatus and Bacteroides uniformis that while they're not mucin degraders, they have pretty broad uh, abilities to, to, to degrade uh, the fiber polysaccharides. So Mahesh built a, a model where he just cultured these 14 species uh, individually and implanted them into wild type mice that were fed a fiber rich diet. And if he watched those mice for uh, an almost two month experiment taking periodic time points and, and enumerating these organisms, the community uh, implants with uh, a characteristic uh, composition with B theta and lots of uh, B ovatus in yellow and Eubacterium in blue. And if that diet, which is this black bar on the X axis remains unchanged, this high fiber diet, then uh, that composition stays relatively uh, stable over the course of that experiment. In contrast, in this treatment, what Mahesh did was he implanted on that same high fiber diet, which is why these first two weeks of this experiment look like the panel at the left. But after two weeks, he removed that high fiber diet and he uh, gave the mice a, a fiber free diet, or at least a diet that's devoid of fibers that are accessible by these, uh, known to be accessible from the data on that last slide by the, uh, the 14 members of this microbiota. So you can see that essentially within 24 to 36 hours, that community composition crashes. We lose the, uh, the blue and the, the red and, and, and the yellow fiber degraders. And we see an expansion of organisms like Bacteroides KK and Acromancy mucinophila that are known from those previous experiments to be, to be mucus degraders. And what, so first level, level of support that low dietary fiber would promote uh, mucus degradation. Uh, that had been uh, discovered by others as, as well in, in, in simple, simpler systems. But, and, and what Mahesh went on to do was do say, RNA, uh, for example, RNA-seq experiments on these communities at the endpoint and RNA-seq on these and could <clears throat> verify that there was more fiber degrading activity in these microbiota and more mucin degrading uh, activity in these microbiota. But the really uh, impressive uh, piece of data was when we got the, uh, the histology back on these mice and stained for mucin, those mice that were maintained on a high fiber diet had thick, uh, quote unquote, healthy looking mucus. We don't know whether this is as healthy or thick as it could be, but uh, it was thicker, uh, especially by blinded measurements over here, compared to the mucus layers of those mice that were, that were starved for fiber. So uh, quick reminder, there was more mucus degrading uh, bacteria, more mucus degrading enzymes over here. And then one of the consequences of that was physical erosion of this, this, of this mucus layer. Maybe even uh, as uh, this inset shows here, DAPI stained particles, which are undoubtedly bacteria uh, beginning to breach and, 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 and cross that layer accessing the host. Uh, Mahesh was really disappointed that this didn't fully support his hypothesis. So these wild type mice with this eroded mucus layer didn't get sick. Uh, they had a tiny little increase in, in sequel uh, inflammation uh, indicating that there was uh, lipocalin, uh, an inflammatory marker, indicating that they were mounting a little bit of inflammatory response, but really nothing uh, significant to write home about. Uh, so he went back to the drawing board and actually took these mice with thick mucus on a high fiber diet and thin mucus on a low fiber diet and challenged them with a, a proteobacterial pathogen. So Citrobacter rodentium is an E. coli attaching an effacing like pathogen that uses its type 3 secretion system to access this epithelial niche. And uh, his hypothesis was that these, these uh, mice that, that had a reduced barrier to repel that, uh, that, uh, that mucosal pathogen would, would get more sick. And in fact, that was supported by the fact that 60% of these mice actually died before 10 days of, of introducing Citrobacter rodentium, whereas all these mice uh, basically survived that infection. So suggesting some consequences of, uh, of our diet history and its effects on our barrier function and how we interact with pathogens. But uh, Mahesh's in initial hypothesis was that uh, in the absence of, a, of an overt pathogen like Citrobacter, uh, this diet by microbiome combination could potentially uh, impact uh, disease and inflammation. So uh, many of you in the audience are, uh, I'm sure, also familiar with this, but this is just a quick 30-second uh, overview of, of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, which uh, encompasses Crohn's disease, which is uh, characterized by patchy inflammation in the, in the, 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 the gut, not just the colon but adjacent to uh, non-involved areas, uh, as well as ulcerative colitis, which uh, more characteristically starts uh, distally in, in, in the colon and then progresses up, upward in a continuous uh, manner as, as patients uh, deal with this. So these are uh, conditions of spontaneous inflammation that in the last 
20 years or so, the, uh, largely driven by, by, by the GWAS era, uh, we collectively have come to appreciate, are driven by a, a lot of underlying and, and, and complex uh, uh, predisposing genetics. Uh, so this Venn diagram just, just, just summarizes genes that are known uh, up to, till a few years ago, probably many more now, to be involved in, in these two forms of inflammatory bowel disease and as you can appreciate, and probably many of you uh, already know, that a lot of these uh, functions, uh, when they're altered, in some cases diminished, reduce things like uh, innate immunity, adaptive immunity, the epithelial barrier, uh, things that you would uh, logically, uh, features of the GI that you logically think would be there at that interface between uh, host tissue uh, and, and, and the microbiota. Two of them that I highlighted here uh, are, we would expect to be, or known to be directly involved in glycosylation of mucus. Uh, so FUT2 stands for fucosyl transferase 2. This is an enzyme, by the way, that up to 20% of us uh, derive from European descent uh, are missing and therefore uh, display the, the, the so-called uh, non-secretor phenotype. But this enzyme uh, puts an alpha, a terminal alpha-2 link fucose on the glycan chains that are, that are attached to mucus. So it would make this modification. And for those of us who don't have it, uh, we, we don't have this. So our glycan change would end in something like, uh, something like this. Uh, this is the, the, the blood group H antigen, by the way. Blood group A and B, which are in your mucus, are built on top of this. A more severe mutation that's known to be associated with mucus glycosyl glycosylation is COSMIC, which stands for core one synthase molecular chaperone. So core one synthase is a uh, galactosyl transferase that adds this galactose beta-1,3 uh, uh, residue to GALNAC which is essential for building these core structures. So if you don't build this, you can't put this uh, residue on the end, obviously, but you also don't build this core two structure. So people who are missing this, this is an, uh, an excellent trait associated with, uh, with human IBD uh, that, that uh, occurs in, in, uh, predominantly in males, uh, have reduced glycosylation on, on, on their mucus so that their, their mucus glycans aren't as fully complex as these other ones. And when this is modeled in, in mice by knocking out this transferase, uh, uh, mouse models of this develop spontaneous inflammation, suggesting that the mucus layer can be uh, uh, associated with them predisposing to, uh, to IBD. We chose to, to work with uh, uh, one uh, IBD genetic model that's, uh, that we had here in our germ-free facility, uh, mice lacking the, uh, the anti-inflammatory cytokine interleukin-10 or IL-10. Uh, I probably don't also need to introduce this much more because there's been uh, so much historic work uh, done at, at the University of North Carolina in, in, in this IL-10 model, uh, in the starter lab uh, and, and, and others. But uh, we had these mice uh, available. And uh, interestingly, this was discovered, uh, it's kind of the, the, uh, the exception to the, the, the GWAS. So the uh, IL-10 was first discovered in mice in the 90s. And uh, the starter lab was uh, the, uh, the lab that showed that raising those mice as germ-free uh, reduces uh, the inflammation, which was the phenotype of knocking out uh, IL-10 in, in mice. And when it showed up in humans uh, in the late 2000s, around 2009, 2010, it was associated with uh, neonatal uh, early onset, very early onset disease. So we've set up a model in this system a couple of different ways. Uh, and uh, I just streamlined things a little, streamlined uh, my slides a little bit to, to, to show you the one that we use the, the, the most now, because I think this is the most relevant. So to... Uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, capture the idea of getting this disease in the perinatal period after maternal transmission of microbes. We take that same SM14 that Mahesh used, same 14 commensal species. We colonize uh, uh, mom and dad mice uh, or look at our specific pathogen free mice, which here in our, co in our colony don't typically get uh, uh, disease in, in, in our IL-10 model. And we allow them to pass their respective microbes to their pups at birth. Uh, these are all uh, IL-10 mice. And then at weaning, we, we wean those pups typically uh, as close as we can get to half of each litter uh, onto a fiber-rich diet or a fiber-free diet. And we, we go to different endpoints, but the data I'll start with uh, typically goes to a 100-day uh, endpoint. This also works if we colonize adult germ-free mice that have never seen a microbiota between six and eight weeks old, and typically we take them out 60 days. And I'll show you some data of that. I'll just label that as the adult model, but two different models where we put uh, commensal human species not associated with disease into these IL-10 mice and ask if we can potentiate disease with diet. So uh, interestingly, when, when we do this and when we look at pups from four different groups here, so these are um, uh, IL-10 pups that got the, the 14 species human microbiota from their parents or a, a more diverse conventional uh, SPF micro, uh, microbiota from their parents. 
fed either the fiber rich diet in the, the two top conditions or the fiber free diet in the two bottom conditions. The only condition where we see uh, disease begin to manifest, at least by the, by the gross uh, uh, readout of weight loss, is in this red group. So uh, the mice with the human 14 species uh, and uh, fed the fiber free diet. If we go to that 100 day endpoint, uh, we lose 85% uh, of those mice by 100 days. We don't lose any of the fiber free mice. If we take uh, a group on an open end timeline, just five days longer, we get 100% lethality, whereas we can take this green group uh, at least out to 150 days, which is as, as long as we've gone, and we see 100% survival. So a really nice difference between uh, the outcomes of, of, of these, two, uh, uh, these two models exclusively driven by, by, by the diet that we feed to the mice. When we look, and this is, this is data from the adult model, but it, it's, it's the same in, in the pup transmission model. When we look at what the histology uh, tells us about where the disease is occurring, uh, by far the, the worst disease occurs in, in the cecum of these mice. So everything about these two groups of adult mice is the same. The, they're both IL-10 mice. They both have the exact same 14 species, but uh, microbiota, but the microbiota is driven to do different physiology and different composition by the diet they're fed. So in mice fed high fiber, there's healthy sequel mucosa with uh, typical crypt architecture and goblet cells that are white here. And this uh, sequel uh, mucosa over here is, is very diseased and ulcerated and uh, infiltrated with, with neutrophils. And, and, and this is uh, arguably why these mice are losing weight uh, and, and, and getting sick. And this is just the, the, the quantification of the adult uh, disease over here. We were interested that the SPF mice, even though we feed them this fiber-free diet are actually spared uh, in, in this condition. So uh, potentially pushing the endogenous members of the microbiota in this purple condition to, uh, to, to, to cause disease. And comparing uh, uh, cecolipicatelin, so this is a neutrophil uh, marker of inflammation. So when it's high in these mice that got sick, uh, it, it indicates inflammation. Uh, the SPF mice were noticeably uh, reduced in their, in their inflammation uh, compared to, to this group over here. Uh, both by this marker and by histology. And uh, I, I didn't show it today just in, in the interest of time, but we've done the, the, uh, the obvious experiments with these uh, SPF mice that don't get sick and these uh, humanized SM14 mice that don't get sick by co-housing them uh, to address the question of whether or not there's uh, a protective organism here or a particular bad actor over here. And the one organism that either sticks around in these mice when we co-house them with these SPF mice is Acromancia mucinophila, that mucin degrading organism. And the one organism that invades from this community over to these mice is Acromancia mucinophila. So we, we don't quite have a clear resolution yet, but we think that uh, Acromancia might in this model be a particular bad actor that's, that's, that's driving this disease. And it's not present in these purple mice to actually to, to, to potentiate this. But we still uh, have some more time course uh, data to, to, to sift through to, to really get a, a view on that. The really uh, attractive part, and one of the reasons why uh, Mahesh thought about setting this model up this way uh, in the beginning, was that by starting with the synthetic microbiota in germ-free mice, we can uh, keep uh, keep very nice track of all, all the individual variables, begin to uh, to uh, unravel all of the components that go into something uh, as complex as getting inflammation, which in these mice arises when we have the lack of, uh, of interleukin-10, the microbiota present, uh, this human microbiota is in fed a fiber-free diet. So if we, if we restore any, in, in, any individual one of those variables, so keep these two and give them high fiber, the mice are okay. We saw that these mice didn't lose weight. If we don't colonize the mice and keep them germ-free despite these two problematic variables being held, mice don't get sick. And if we have normal IL-10 function in wild-type mice, we do see some lift off of this lipocalin uh, uh, inflammatory marker. This is the same as what Mahesh observed in his wild-type mice but it doesn't get to the same severe level that we see over here. So we need all three of these factors coming together in, in congruence to cause disease. And what we're really interested in doing going forward is beginning to figure out, and really when it gets support for the hypothesis that it is actually mucus degrading bacteria and the lack of mucus as a result of their activity that, that causes this disease. So again, since it's a notobiotic model, we know who the four mucus degrading bacteria are. They're shown here in red we can eliminate them from the community. So these are the mice that have the full community, 14 members that get sick. This 14 to 10 transition is the result of taking away those four known mucus degraders. And by this marker, uh, also by weight and also by histology, uh, these mice uh, don't get as sick. 
And quite interestingly, if we add individual mucus degraders back, uh, BKK, B theta, Barnesiella, and Acromancia, they, the mice also don't get uh, as sick by these markers. So uh, we think that we need synergy between multiple uh, organisms, uh, multiple uh, yeast integrating organisms to present together to, to, to fully develop that disease. And once we understand that, we're interested in eventually going in and doing uh, genetics in, in these organisms to start uh, refining down the, the, uh, the particular functions that are involved. We've also just recently got some data uh, addressing this question of what happens if we eliminate mucus genetically on the host side. So essentially go in and look at this condition where on a high fiber diet, uh, IL-10 mice don't get sick, but if we breed, if we take uh, this condition and breed IL-10 uh, MUC2 double knockout mice and colonize them with these, with these 14 human microbes fed a fiber rich diet, uh, they get really sick uh, despite that, that high fiber diet, which uh, gives us more support for the fact that it's the mucus layer, not the diet uh, that's, that's potentiating this interaction with, uh, with, with the microbiota to, to promote disease. The last uh, two uh, stories I, I, I wanna, uh, I wanna to highlight are uh, address a question that uh, comes up frequently whenever I present to, uh, to crowds with gastroenterologists present, which is uh, I'm sure uh, members of this crowd. And that's the question of why does exclusive enteral nutrition uh, which is uh, one of those products is this Nestle Nutrin product. These are products that are given to uh, particularly uh, uh, pediatric uh, Crohn's patients and have been shown to be uh, restorative. I even uh, put a disclaimer down here not to interpret this as, uh, as evidence that, that, that these don't work. Uh, there's, there's ample evidence that they do, but these are basically low fiber diets. In fact, this Nestle Nutrin product is not just devoid of fiber, but its composition looks a lot like our fiber-free diet that causes this disease when we give it to mice with the, this human microbiota and, and this IL-10 function. So uh, we, did, we did this experiment thinking that uh, uh, feeding mice this, we bought liters, uh, tens of liters of this, dried it down so that the only food that we were feeding to mice was a dried form of this nutrient diet combined with their, uh, their water, uh, both ad libitum. And we fed it to the mice thinking that it was gonna result in, in, in disease just like this red condition over here that makes the mice sick. And interestingly, we do see some, uh, some, uh, some uh, disease uh, related phenotypes. So the mice lose weight, but they're intermediate between the mice that get really sick and the mice that, that don't get sick on the high fiber diet. And when you go in and look at uh, either uh, histology or lipocalin, we have uh, more mice here now processed there's this notice, noticeable variability in the amount of, of disease activity we get. So this is low, essentially as low as the protected fiber rich mice. Uh, some high mice that are essentially the same as the, the ones that get sick and then some in, uh, in between. We don't have uh, all of the histology fully processed yet, but these two mice that were essentially devoid of any histological inflammation were two of the ones that, that, that were down here in, in this group as well. And so, a different phenotype than we expected. And, and we went in and, and dug in a little bit further. And uh, Gabriel uh, did a, it, it started looking at the metabolites that are produced uh, in, the, in the Sika of these mice. And curiously, uh, in the, the, uh, the Sika of mice in this blue condition, which is the ones that are fed the, uh, the EEN diet, there's a variable range of, of a, uh, a branch chain uh, uh, fatty acid called isobutyrate. Uh, isobutyrate is produced not from short chain, uh, not from carbohydrate uh, fermentation like short chain fatty acids are, but it's produced, uh, thought to only be produced from valine fermentation uh, in, in anaerobic uh, gut bacteria. And so this was produced at variable levels. And these mice that I've circled up here uh, as being uh, high producers were the ones that were protected from disease. So there seemed to be a pretty good correlation between uh, high amounts of isobutyrate and, and, and high amounts of, and low amounts of disease. Curiously, in these EEN mice, which are at 100 days with this condition over here, compared to the mice that got sick on this fiber-free diet, which were those shown over here, there was a 250-fold uh, increase in the abundance of this, uh, this gram-positive Firmicute, Ebacterium rectali. Uh, Erectali is known to be a butyrate producer, which is a particular uh, short-chain fatty acid that's uh, thought to be protective in, in the colon. Uh, but uh, we've tested it and it's not known, we, we can't yet show it to be an isobutyrate producer. So we don't know whether this increase in, uh, in EREC in, in any way corresponds with this, but we're uh, beginning to, to, to do the experiments to try and figure out uh, what's going on. But uh, this is just a, a plot showing the correlation between uh, inflammation by uh, lipocalin and, and the amount of isobutyrate. And it, it 
interestingly seems to be once you get over this threshold of around 35 millimolar, the mice are protected and have low inflammation and below that we start seeing, uh, we start seeing more disease development. But we don't yet know uh, who is making it. Uh, but nevertheless, Gabriel went and did the experiment that, uh, that was obvious to us, which is asked the question of just if we take this condition that makes the mice sick, that our low fiber diet in these conditions, and put isobutyrate in their water or butyrate as a, as a comparison control, uh, both of those groups of mice are, are protected to some degree uh, compared to uh, not having the isobutyrate or butyrate in their water. So we're actively looking at what the mechanism of action of this is. And, uh, it, it may be different from butyrate, it may be the same as butyrate, but uh, we're very interested in, in why we see this gradation in, uh, in effect, but also who's making it uh, and what are they making it from and how can we uh, figure out a way to optimize this. This may be a, an orthogonal pathway uh, to, to uh, producing the increasing production of a, of a beneficial metabolite that's important in the gut. And I, I'll apologize, I forgot to put a, uh, any kind of a, a of a segue in here, but just in the last few minutes, I wanted to highlight some of the uh, the uh, molecular studies we're doing on, on on mucin degradation. And this is that bioarchive paper that I, I highlighted from uh, from Anna Lewish. Uh, uh, really cool study. And, and what Anna wanted to do was ask uh, what functions, uh, uh, what enzymes are important for gut bacteria that that degrade mucin. And uh, I think I highlighted a few times that the mucin that we've been using to characterize organisms in the gut that are capable of using mucus or not is from, uh, from the gastric mucosa of pigs. Uh, we know from an, analyzing that as well as from uh, uh, literature on, on that material that it's virtually devoid of, of sulfate. There is some sulfate there, but there's, there's not a lot. Sulfate's one of those, those uh, covalent modifications that's uh, potentially added to, to mucin glycans. In contrast, uh, mucin from the colon, which uh, is probably relevant, at least in that, in, in that uh, uh, layer that's overlying the epithelium and produced by host goblet cells uh, is heavily sulfated. So uh, Anna went and purified uh, a, a custom batch of colonic mucin glycans. Uh, we have horrifying pictures from this. We go to, to pig slaughters and get the, the warm colons right out of the mice and take them to a fume hood and scrape out the, the mucin and bring it back to the lab. And she's characterized this in collaboration with Gunnar Hansen, uh, showing that it has uh, 131 different uh, glycan structures uh, in it. it give or take a few, depending on the batch, uh, and it's very highly sulfated. And so what I've highlighted here, what uh, we've highlighted here in, in blue on this x-axis are organisms that we know can uh, very actively degrade uh, gastric uh, mucin glycan, so the, the unsulfated substrate. And what she's showing here on this, uh, on this y-axis is the amount of growth in two different experiments on this highly sulfated colonic mucin glycan mix. So uh, organisms like B theta and BKK, which are uh, the same strains that are in our synthetic microbiota and others like B fragilis, are, are very good degraders of the sulfated colonic mucin. Whereas curiously, organisms like Acromancy mucinophila, which is, grows great on, on unsulfated uh, mucus, mucin glycans, uh, has uh, at least this, this type strain has no ability to grow on this. So uh, highlighting that the, the source of where you get your mucus and, and subsequent the glycan sources of that uh, it, uh, is important. None of these strains, by the way, can grow on intact mucin to glycoprotein, but we, we've got ones that do, and we're, uh, we're working on those as well. So uh, probably speaking to the, the complexity of the, the synergy between these organisms. But just in B theta alone, uh, these are 18 different gene clusters that were, uh, these are clusters that were on that circle uh, diagram that I showed way back in the beginning, containing uh, 38 different enzymes uh, are known from our previous studies to be in, in, involved in, in mucin degradation. So when you grow on colonic mucins or gastric mucins, uh, many of these become transcriptionally active in different conditions. And uh, Anna in her postdoc and now in collaboration with Gunnar Hansen's lab has gone through and purified all 38 of these enzymes, uh, uh, 28 different sulfatases, which are shown in, in, in green and it's greenish yellow color. And then glycoside hydrolases, which are in, in this blue color. And she's systematically worked out a pathway for how these enzymes uh, deconstruct those, those, those mucin glycans. And uh, that's a study that, we're, that we're, we're currently in the process of, of writing up, but uh, she can account for all the activities like blood group A removing enzymes and B and blood group H, which is that fucosidase and basically everything else. But what she's found just in a study of the sulfatases, these enzymes that remove 
uh, the sulfate modifications from, uh, from sulfated conic mucinoglycans and uh, are arguably important for that unique ability, of some of those strains to grow on, on colonic mucin, uh, is that B theta has uh, activities that target uh, virtually all of the linkages. So uh, mucin uh, glycans in the colon have sulfate in four different positions. Uh, either as uh, terminal galactose three sulfate, six sulfate, or four sulfate, which are schematized here, or uh, N-acetyl uh, glucosamine uh, six sulfate, which could either be internal to chains like this or, or, or also terminal. And what Anna did by recombinantly expressing all of these sulfatases and also looking at them in a phylogenetic context was figure out that uh, these enzymes over here, for example, are all galactose three sulfatases. These two, uh, these ones are galactose six sulfatases. Uh, and characterize them. We have structures of these, of these enzymes that uh, speak to their specificity. But uh, quite interestingly, when Anna went and uh, this is uh, work in collaboration with Gunnar Hansen's lab in, in Gothenburg and started characterizing some of these enzymes that now she knows uh, which enzymes take six sulfate uh, from a glycan chain and which ones cleave three sulfate and next six sulfate, they're not all active. So just for as a, a, a one example to highlight, there's three uh, uh, galactose three sulfatases, 1622, 4683, and 1636. And what this heat map shows, every line here is an individual glycan that she can see an ion by uh, LCMS, MS, so they, uh, their M over Z scores. And where you see green basically is a structure that was present but not detected after treatment with that enzyme. So this BT1622 enzyme, even though it's active in vitro on a model substrate, is totally wimpy on any of these colonic uh, mucin substrates. Uh, this 4683 enzyme has uh, targets a few of these structures, but this BT1636 enzyme is really broadly active uh, on a number of different structures. So when you look at the real glycans that this organism would see uh, in the gut from a colonic source, at the enzyme level, there, there, there's uh, specificity for, uh, for what catalysis uh, is being uh, performed. And so uh, Anna then went to do the genetics and We've known for a long time that, that you can cripple all of the sulfatases in anaerobic gut bacteria like B theta by knocking out a, a gene that encodes a, uh, a, a, an enzyme called ANSME for anaerobic sulfatase maturating enzyme. So ANSME uh, is required for activating sulfatases uh, uh, co-translationally or, or, or post-translationally. So deleting this gene basically eliminates all the sulfatase activity. So this is how B theta grows on highly sulfated colonic mucin glycans. Uh, most of which are sulfated. There's some residual ones that aren't. And the, this ANSME mutant uh, grows noticeably more poorly. If Anna just knocks out that, that single BT1636 that has that GAL3 sulfate removing activity, the phenotype is essentially the same as this, as this mutant that uh, lacks all sulfatases. And what she went on to do was uh, delete uh, 10 different sulfatases from the B theta genome, including BT1636 that alone gives this phenotype which is why this phenotype looks basically the same over here, and just added BT1636 back in as uh, one of those 10 uh, back into the genome. It restores a, a growth phenotype on colonic uh, oligos that looks just like this one. So we're really excited by this because we think this speaks to the idea that there's critical keystone steps in a complex pathway like mucin glycan degradation. Uh, BT1636 uh, may very well be one of them, at least in, 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 uh, in the pig and the mouse gut, and if we can identify those steps and block them, then we can uh, divine, uh, design specific inhibitors that, that, that shut down potentially de deleterious pathways like, uh, like mucus degradation. And uh, I think I'm just a little bit uh, over my, my target time, but I'll just uh, end with this, uh, with this summary slide and I'll keep this up during the discussion. But uh, what I've highlighted today is that our uh, symbiotic gut bacteria perform uh, much of our polysaccharide digestion, uh, by definition, like all of our fiber uh, digestion, but they can also go after the endogenous uh, things that we make and probably the endogenous things that uh, bacteria make. Uh, but there's substantial niche specialization. So there's fiber degraders that go after uh, certain subsets of fibers, uh, as well as some organisms that degrade uh, protective mucus. And through diet, we can inflict community-wide changes that alter that, that uh, homeostasis between uh, us and our gut microbes in part by altering the way they interact with, with the mucus barrier, uh, undoubtedly a, a countless other physiologies and metabolites. And uh, this has implications for pathogen susceptibility. Uh, I think it has implications for chronic diseases uh, that are increasing with uh, industrialization uh, and industrialized diets like IBD and colorectal cancer. 
And with respect to that last point, we're really excited for uh, at the, the, the prospect of finding critical early steps in these organisms. And if we have critical sulfatases that, uh, that are important for a broad number of, uh, of mucin degrading bacteria, then uh, potentially we can block these steps to, uh, to block the harmful parts of, of bacterial mucus erosion. And uh, I'll end there and I'll come out of presentation mode and I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts and, and uh, questions, comments, discussion. So thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you. That was, a, that was a fantastic talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I have one question and then there are a lot of questions in the chat that I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna try to cover. Um, I only have one question regarding the uh, horizontal gene transfer between these bacteroides that have such a, a, a rich um, repertoire. Do you know, because it seems that, the, uh, that you have these very defined groups that can uh, one can digest this specific like and this one other and so on. So what do you know about the uh, horizontal gene transfer between the bacteroid species? Uh, we know, we, I, I think we know uh, a reasonable amount. So there's, there's definitely examples of horizontal gene transfer occurring by uh, classical mechanisms like integrative chromosomal elements. So there's, there's some, some really cool stories uh, about like the uh, ability to degrade seaweed polysaccharides that are in like sushi wrappers that uh, apparently came from marine organisms uh, on chromosomal elements. And we have a, a paper that's in review, it's also in bioarchives, uh, outlining some of those. Uh, those seem to be the exception. So a, a mobile element that is excising from the genome, and I wouldn't say the exception, but they seem to be more rare than, than another type of event, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. But uh, there's, there's, there's events where mobile elements, uh, mobilizable plasmids or uh, conjugated elements can carry uh, cargo genes back and forth. Uh, in that paper that we're getting ready to submit on, on that, that phenotypic analysis. Uh, we did a, uh, a pan-genomic analysis with a collaborator here at Michigan and just uh, a, a subset of, of Bacteroides ovatus and Bacteroides xylana solvent strains. And what that analysis revealed was that there's massive diversity in the pan-genome at the level of these gene clusters, uh, these polysaccharide utilization loci. Uh, just uh, breathtaking mosaicity in, in the genomes. And, most of those events where you see gene clusters present or absence across different genomes or related uh, strains of a, within a species, there's very little indication of, of how those genes got there. They're, they're basically just precisely inserted in between housekeeping genes of different, uh, different common functions. And what we were able to, to get data for in, in, in the pan-genome analysis was that in some cases, if you compare, uh, we compared uh, Bacteria xylenus solvens and Bacteria ovatus to each other, if you, you can find cases where a gene cluster becomes present in, in say Bacteries ovatus and the flanking genes share a signature of being more closely homologous to a different species like Bacteria xylena solvens. So we think that's evidence that, that these bacteria found a way to conjugate their chromosomes with each other. Mm -hmm. And when they do so, they basically, if, if there's enough homologous region between their chromosomes to have homologous recombination on both sides of a site, which I don't know, over evolutionary time, that probably begins to become very relevant. You can replace, you can either knock in or knock out genes between uh, strains of, of related species. And so we think that's going on and uh, that speaks to some of the diversity, but it, I, I don't think it addresses how these novel genes basically evolve in the first place. I think we need to look to other mechanisms like gene duplication and diversification for for, for those events, but there's, th there is evidence for, uh, for uh, multiple mechanisms of lateral transfer. Right, that is, that is amazing. So I have a question from Balfour Sartor. Um, I, I think this was posted when you were talking about the IL-10 model and the two different diets. Um, have you explored different type of fibers? Which fiber did you use? Key point for therapeutic supplementation with fiber sources. Yeah, I didn't show the data uh, I think the last time I presented this at a Keystone meeting, uh, Balfour, you asked me uh, you should try use, using Metamucil for, based on some of Jay Faith's data. Right. Uh, uh, we haven't tried that, but we've tried, uh, we've worked with a company here in, in, in Michigan that makes fibers that they, that they provide to the food industry. So they're, they're in the town right next to Kellogg's. So they deal a lot with Kellogg's 
uh, we've tried some of their fibers. So we've tried uh, an oat-based fiber that they, that they produce. It's largely insoluble, part cellulose, part uh, oat-beta glucan and arabinozylan. We tried an apple fiber and we tried a wheat-based fiber. And interestingly, if we put those back into that fiber-free diet, uh, almost stoichiometrically with the amount of, of glucose that we removed, those are all, are all also protective. So we tried three different fibers that vary at some level in their, in, in their, uh, their chemical composition of, of the, the fibers and they all worked. Yeah. So well, the, the, the reason I ask is this really is clinically important because uh, Jay and his uh, DSS model, tour de force gastro paper said that cellulose actually made things worse where psyllium was protected. And many gastroenterologists give cellulose as a fiber source. Uh, and uh, I'm worried that that's really the wrong thing to do. So I, I do think that this is a highly clinically relevant area and I'm glad to see you're uh, exploring uh, different uh, sources. But I mean, you have the perfect model that you can take commercially available fiber supplements and you know, do a uh, uh, clinically relevant, uh, that'd, be a, that'd be a student or a, you know, grad student uh, you know, type, type project that could be quickly pulled off uh, since you have the model. We, we did analyze the, uh, the cellulose composition in those three fibers that we tested. And the, at least the, the oat fiber and the wheat fiber that were both protective in, re, in reducing uh, inflammation, they both had about 40 to 45% cellulose in them. And they yeah. didn't really have remarkably impactful changes on the microbiome. So yeah. there could be but, something. But, but, right, but, but can, can, could you also entertain the thought that a low fiber diet has high glucose, which itself could be detrimental. Uh, I mean, we, we've done work showing that high, high, uh, high glucose or uh, high fructose, even worse with fructose, uh, accelerates colitis in the IL-10 knockout model. So maybe it's not the fiber at all, but the, the, the presence of uh, glucose to make it uh, uh, isocaloric. Yep. We, we, we've, we definitely had our eye on, on glucose. I mean, so our, our low fiber diet has gobs of, of glucose in it. It's 40% glucose. Uh, we just tested a diet where we, uh, uh, Cargill was kind enough to give us a, a really highly soluble uh, starch product that uh, based on its formulation and then drying should be glucose in the form of, of very easily digestible starch. And we tried to, I think we replaced 37% of the glucose in that, uh, in that diet, uh, in this case, stoichiometrically with that starch, which should uh, provide glucose in the upper GI and then whatever is not digested would be starch for the, for the, for the microbiota and not glucose. And that also resulted in disease. Okay. So we tried to address that that way, but I, I think there, there's definitely the, the possibility that the, the high sugar is another confounding variable. Yep. From, um, I have from Tessa Anderman, what, uh, why do you think that a low fiber diet like the FODMAP is used to treat IBD, but is harmful in murine models? Is this known? Uh, I don't know about the, uh, in the, the, the murine model part, but uh, I, I think part of the idea of some of those FODMAP diets is that the, the ingredients that are, uh, the, 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 nutrients that are, that are contraindicated or avoided there tend to be more soluble, uh, highly fermentable uh, oligosaccharides and, and polyols. So your uh, things like inulin prebiotics, which is uh, we kind of refer to as, as rocket fuel for the microbiota because it's, it's so many organisms degrade it and they can degrade it quite quickly because of its solubility. If you have sensitivity towards gas and bloating, then having your, your microbiota ramped up into a highly active mode uh, producing that gas very quickly might be might be deleterious or might cause uh, might cause mot motility issues. Uh, I I think that that not being an expert on, on on FODMAP diet might be one thought about why those why those work. No, I mean in, in reality the FODMAP really has no evidence that it decreases inflammation in IBD, but I think it's exactly what you're saying. It's the fermentable. Uh, gas forming, uh, and it's the IBS component of some IBD patients that, that's probably being helped. Thank you. And, and, and on the contrary, there's surprisingly few people studying, like, you know, the, I, I mentioned those three fiber products, we get them from a food supplier. There's surprisingly few people studying these insoluble fibers that 
are some of the things that actually go into our, our, our foods and they're, they're far cheaper than prebiotics like inulin. So I think they're, I think they're interesting things to look at. Yeah, definitely have potential. Um, from Jonathan Hansen, I'm surprised that inflammation isolated to the cecum would cause weight loss in mice. Were other areas of the GI tract inflamed, small bowel in particular? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So we do see some in the, in the ileum and we see uh, other parts in the colon, but it, it's, it's by far the worst in, in, in the cecum. Uh, and our hypothesis for, for that, and uh, I don't know uh, as much as probably some, some folks here would, would know about the absorptive capacity across all those different uh, epithelial tissues. Obviously, I think as you're applying more goes on in, in the small intestine. But I, I think why we see the disease get so bad in the cecum is that that's kind of that, that intermediate zone where the, the mucus system is, is the, it's different than the colon. It's probably the weakest and the most kind of ephemeral in, in, in the cecum. And that's the point where your microbial density goes up to you know, 10 to the 10th compared to the, compared to the ileum. So you have, you have high bacterial activity and you have thinner mucus. Whereas as things begin to get, uh, uh, water, water begins to get absorbed and you begin to get drying down farther down the colon, you begin to get the, uh, the layering of the mucus begin to form. Uh, interestingly, when we, uh, we're still waiting on, on all the histology from our IL-10 muc two double knockout mice. But when we took the mucus layer away uh, genetically in the mice, uh, as you might imagine, those mice got sick real fast. Typically, they they need to be uh, euthanized because of weight loss between 20 and 30 days after colonization. But there, the disease occurs virtually everywhere. So we just they're just big inflamed colons all the way on down. So we think that's additional support that that the mucus system fails first in the cecum, and when we when we genetically remove it everywhere, we get we get inflammation everywhere. But I don't know if I know how to address the uh, the question about nutrient absorption and weight loss uh, as it relates to the sequel tissue. We, we, we have plated spleens and livers of these mice and we don't see bacterial dissemination. So we, we don't think that we're getting widespread dissemination of the E. coli or anything else uh, out of the gut, but we see most of the destruction occur in, in the sequel. Uh, from Jin Yi Tan, does the IL-10 knockout status affect the proportion of mucin degrading taxa in your 14 mix compared to wild type? Uh, I was just talking to Gabriel this morning about the need to pin that question down. So we, we have one experiment where we had a, a, a mixed group of wild type and IL-10 mice. Uh, I don't think our numbers were high enough to get microbiome, uh, good microbiome statistics, but the answer does seem to be yes. Uh, compared to wild type mice fed that fiber free diet, the IL 10 ones have noticeably higher E. coli. And that, maybe that's not surprising because E. coli is uh, known to, to benefit from these, these uh, uh, lowly inflamed environments where uh, some of the anaerobes might, uh, might not uh, be able to thrive as much. But B theta was also uh, enhanced in, in those mice. So the E. coli is not known to degrade mucus, but the, the B theta uh, is a mucus degrader, but we don't typically see it uh, proliferate as well in our, in our wild type model. So I think yes, and I think it's those two species, but we haven't got a good systematic analysis over multiple biological replicates yet. Yeah, that's a good question. And then the last one from uh, Gabriel Suarez, which other than the mucin degrading enzymes, uh, which other bacteria metabolite differences between fiber and fiber free conditions do you also consider important? Uh, I think it could be anything. I think it's a tough question. I mean, it could be uh, the isobutyrate was a complete surprise. Mm. And uh, it's, I, I think, uh, just, just one of the reasons to do the experiment in the, in the first place and see what happens, because uh, we thought it was going to come out one way and it potentially led us to something, uh, something unexpected. Uh, yeah, I think, I think the sky is the limit when it comes to uh, other products and we're interested in uh, bacteriophage that might be resident in some of these organisms. And we, we know that some of our, of our, even in the SM14, some of the bacteria have uh, endogenous lysogens that begin to pop out in vivo. So mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at those. That was, that was very interesting. Well, um, thank you so much. I see that Matt has his hand up. You have a question, Matt? I do, yeah, if, if there's time. Um, 
It's a great talk. Two more minutes. I have soccer and I'm the coach. Just like, so okay. I cannot be late. I'll make it real fast. No worries. All right. The the uh, uh, part of your mouse model where you fed them the dried down Nestle, essentially that protein shake looking thing. Um, and the phenotype where you saw the increase in isobutyrate, I thought that was really striking. Um, is your thought that there are certain proteins present within that, that Nestle drink that are just being fermented by the microbiota differently um, compared to your, the proteins in the fiber-free diet that are producing that isobutyrate? Uh, yeah, I think you nailed our hypothesis. And so I, I had it on the slide as, as text and I forgot to call it out, but the the, we don't know the exact composition of that Nestle product. I don't know if they would tell us if we asked, but the, the protein component, uh, as it's listed on the, the, the ingredient label is soy protein first and then casein. So yeah. I'm assuming two different proteins with the soy being more mm. abundant. Uh, our uh, fiber free is, is all casein. Mm. So we're doing the obvious experiment now of just we, the, the, bat, the protein, uh, the diet should be here soon where we just took our casein and replaced it with soy protein in our fiber free diet. But we've, uh, we just did an experiment where we took some soy protein that we, that soy protein isolate that we bought and we took it through a mock upper GI digestion with, uh, you know, uh, pancreatin and, and pepsin and, and all that and dialyze it. The valine content actually went down twofold in the residue. So we had, it, it speculated that maybe there's a, uh, uh, a soy protein derived source of peptides that have, you know, more valine in them. And, and that still could be the case if there's, you know, uh, I don't know much about how, I don't know if anybody knows much about how gut bacteria target oligopeptides that are, that are residues and in the, from the protein in our diet. Uh, it certainly looked like you back here in Rectali was profiting from something right. to make it, make it go up so much. So yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I would have thought, and, and Manuel Kleiner probably could chime in here and answer better than me, but I would have thought the casein being, I think, a more slowly digestible protein source would have been more accessible to the microbiota, but it seems like it's, it's soy is the smoking gun there. It, it could be, yeah. Or, yeah. The other thing that was in that diet was uh, the EN diet had a, had a maltodextrin in it, which again, hmm. I, I would think would be uh, upper GI digestible and not get through to, to EREC, but EREC is a, uh, as you know, Will, is a, is a great starch and multi-oligosaccharide degrader. So it might be getting enough of that coming through that it changes the, so we're trying to play with as many of those variables as we can, adding back to that fiber-free diet to see if we, we can get something. Yeah, awesome, thank you. All right. So if there are no more questions, uh, thank you so much. There was a, there was a fantastic uh, visit and a fantastic talk. And uh, we hope to see you soon again.